You're listening to the Journey to Launch podcast, how to live a work optional life and retire early the non-penny pinching way with Tanya Hester. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast. If you are new to the podcast, sit back, buckle up. You're in for a treat. If you are a returning journeyer, welcome. Thanks for coming back. On this episode of the podcast, I'm talking to guest Tanya Hester. She was actually on episode 52 of the podcast. I've invited her back to talk about her amazing new book, Work Optional, Retire Early, The Non-Penny-Pinching Way. Tanya retired at age 38 from her career as a political consultant and journalist. She writes at the amazing blog, Our Next Life. She co-hosts the podcast, The Fair Sense, and she's just all around living her best life retired. And I thought it'd be perfect to bring Tanya back on the podcast to talk about the subject we all like talking about the most, financial independence. But Tanya frames it in a way which makes it more accessible, I believe, to people who maybe are not looking to full out retire early. Now, if that's your goal, that's fine. But I love the way Tanya frames the thought process of what early retirement is in her book. And you'll hear us talk more about that. I think it allows you to be more creative with the way in which you retire, the way in which you live your best life and love your best life. So I'm really excited for you to hear the conversation. Tanya actually is someone I met at FinCon. So I always talk about FinCon, the personal finance conference that I went to for the first time a couple of years ago. Well, Tanya was one of the first people that I met at the conference and she has always been super nice, just super cool. I mean, when I went to FinCon a couple of years ago, I was a complete newbie and Tanya had been in the space for a little bit and her blog was really popular. But despite really not knowing me, she really just was super cool and I we just created a good relationship from there and kept in touch ever since. So I'm happy to call Tanya a friend in this space and I'm happy to see that her book is in the world. So I wanna talk more about the book with her and you're gonna hear all about it. I'm also going to give you an opportunity to win Tanya's book. So I have three copies to give away. Stick around to the end of the interview to hear how you can win it. Tanya's book, if you listen to this in real time, comes out on February 12th. This episode releases on February 13th. So the book is in stores now, and I really encourage you to get it. Again, you'll hear all that and how you can get it more in the podcast. If you want any of the episode show notes, you can go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 84. As always, follow me on social media at Journey to Launch so I can see what you thought of the interview. At me, let me know what you thought, screenshot. And don't forget to check out the Journeyer Launch Club. That's my membership community for journeyers who love the content they're hearing on this podcast, but want to take it to the next level. They want to implement. You want to really reach your goals and the Launch Club is a space in which you can do that. You can find out more about that at Journey to Launch dot com slash launch club. Okay, so let's jump in to this amazing conversation with Tanya. Hey, journeyers. I'm excited because I have another special conversation to bring you. And I know you guys love talking about how to become financially independent. You love hearing from people who have actually reached it. So I have another return guest coming on the podcast Tanya Hester from Our Next Life, who has written an amazing book about reaching financial independence called Work Optional. So welcome back to the podcast, Tanya. Thank you so much. You know, you are one of my very favorite podcasts, so it is an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, we were all on this journey. We're at different points. And what I really love about how you frame financial like independence and how you reach it is that you try to meet people where they are 
and you look at it more in a holistic way about the type of life, the quality of life you live on your way to financial independence and then what happens after. So we're going to talk about that. But first, I want to kind of say thank you, because as I was reading the book, I got an advanced copy. Guys, the book is amazing. It comes out on February 12th. So that's the day after this episode releases. Um, Tanya was so gracious enough to actually mention my story in her book, page uh, 29 and 30. So Tanya, thank you for that. Absolutely. No, thank you for being in it. I think that your story adds so much. And what I like, because, you know, I get featured or talked about in certain publications, and I really thought you actually captured everything that I attempted to do and what I'm doing with my life and money really well. And I think it can help a lot of other people on this journey where this whole reaching financial independence is not just this end goal. It's the things that you can do and unlock on the way and the freedom that it allows you. So let's first talk about the title work optional. What does that mean for you? Why, why did you go with work optional? I know we have all these like catchphrases for like what it really means to be financially independent, but why did you choose work optional? Yeah. Work optional to me, it felt like the right title because I do think that there is sometimes the tendency to get hung up on the word retirement and what early retirement means. It also sounds very absolute. It sounds like something that's all or nothing, where to me, work optional is more of a continuum that suggests you might still work a little bit. You might work seasonally. You might just cut back a small amount. Maybe you still work 75%, or maybe you can just be choosier about the work that you do, even if it's still full time. To me, I really wanted to encompass all of that and just help people see different ways that they can make, you know, kind of a dream life possible uh, that isn't something so rigid as early retirement, even though to me, retirement isn't is a word that isn't actually as rigid as people think it is. But I just wanted to kind of avoid that baggage. Mm -hmm. And you actually talk about in the book that retirement is a recent invention, like in the span of where we are in society and that it wasn't actually created for everyone to reach it. Can we just dive a little bit into that history before we get into how we can reach early retirement? Yeah, absolutely. The very first pensions were less than 150 years ago, and they were only meant to kind of give a little bit of cushion to people. Um, but they weren't actually meant to get people to quit working entirely. They were meant to let older workers who were maybe slowing down a bit uh, just work a little bit less and make way uh, for younger workers. And Social Security, which was really the start of true retirement, uh, wasn't passed until 1935. The age 65, it was completely arbitrary, set by actuaries, not by people who understood the human lifespan. Uh, and it wasn't designed for everyone to be able to do it. At, at the time, in 1935, when the Social Security Act passed, I now I'm forgetting the exact number, but it was a tiny fraction of people who actually lived past 65 and would ever benefit from the program. So it's just it's interesting to me that we peg all of this life meaning on age 65 when that's a recent invention. It's an arbitrary number. There's no reason to me why we should plan our lives around it. Mm -hmm. And when you when you think of it in that way, it helps you understand that, OK, just because society or the way things have been done is that's the typical age doesn't mean it has to be. I think where people get caught up is, OK, but then how do I afford a life? in retirement. And that's why I like the concept and what you talk about in your book, because you're not talking about not working. You're talking about working, doing things you love, or just at least making it optional. And you break mm -hmm. down the ways in which like you can do that. So the three stages of work optional living. So fully early retirement, semi retirement and career intermission. Can you go through those stages? Absolutely. So full early retirement is really what I think most people think of as early retirement. You can quit working entirely. Maybe you still have some hobbies or something that pay a little bit, but you never need to work again. Uh, that is what Mark, uh, my husband, and I aimed for and what we were able to accomplish a bit over a year ago. Um, but it's certainly not the right answer for everyone. Semi-retirement would be Really, th this is a very broad category. So it could be uh, changing to a lower paid career. It could be working part time. It could be maybe you work in the summer and take the rest of the year off or vice versa. Uh, it's really a way that 
you you create more space for yourself now to do things that you love and to make time for what's important uh, without having to wait for full retirement to do that. And then career intermission is sometimes people will call this like mini retirement. I actually don't like the term mini retirement because I think you approach a career intermission very differently than you would approach real retirement. Uh, but the intermission idea, you know, it's sort of like half time. You're taking a break. Maybe it's a year. Maybe it's six months. Maybe you can find a way to take a year off every five years. But it's giving yourself a chance to kind of step away from work, to focus on what's important in life for a little while. And just, you know, to have some of those life list kind of adventures and moments, whatever is important to you. Mm-hmm. And now I'm just like, curious on the different ways in which someone has to approach each of those things like there's some basic stuff where you know getting out of debt being aware having the right mindset to be able to do this but if you could just touch upon maybe the different ways one would have to approach this so for example if someone is looking to become fully retired is there the way they aggressively go about saving and investing different from someone who needs semi-retirement? I know the answer to that is yes, but in what ways is that different? In some ways, it might not be different at all. I mean, fundamentally, all of this is about saving money that can then sustain you later on uh, by growing and generating additional money to live on. Um, But I think, you know, if you're doing semi-retirement, you might not need that money in the near term. So if, for example, it costs you forty or $50,000 a year to live and you can earn that through a few consulting gigs and you don't have to work all that much, then maybe what your semi-retirement looks like is just saving fully quickly for your traditional retirement and then sustaining yourself year to year in semi-retirement. So fundamentally what that means is needing to save a whole lot less than if you're going to fully uh, retire early. Uh, But it also could make a difference in terms of where you're saving that money. So looking at things like stock Uh, index funds or bond index funds, those are things you want to be in long term. Whereas if you need some of that money shorter term, maybe you do have some money in savings accounts or CD ladders, things like that. So there is a little bit of an allocation question. But really, it's it's just that you need much, much less potentially to semi-retire or take a career intermission. And that's honestly why I wanted to talk about those things in the book, because I think the reality is that full early retirement is not accessible to everyone. And I wanted to find a way to make some of these ideas accessible to more people. Folks who are earning minimum wage, you know, I think we we have to recognize the realities of our economy and that if you're earning minimum wage right now, it's probably not going to happen, full early retirement. But I do also talk about ways you can think about earning more so that maybe it would become possible. But I just really wanted to, to make some version of early retirement something that people could achieve. Mm, yeah, and I love that because this is essentially what I'm doing, what my husband and I have done. So when we aggressively started saving and investing, and then we started to think about how I'd be able to quit my job, you know, it wasn't easy to walk away from my income, but it mm-hmm. felt okay okay to do that because the amount of money that we had acquired in our retirement accounts and investment accounts, just leaving it on autopilot at this point by the time we would reach traditional retirement, we would have enough supplemented with my husband's pension and some other things to actually live decently. So we would technically never have to actually contribute to it again. Um, and then by the time we reach traditional retirement, we'd be okay. Now that's not to say that we don't want to contribute to it again. My goal is to start ag- aggressively investing once we can, but it allows me to then take this leap and take this break because we haven't been contributing to much of our retirement accounts while I'm on this maybe semi-retirement or career intermission, Mm -hmm. you know? So, and I, and I, and so many people want to at least do this because while now I'm on this break, I am doing work that I love that hopefully will, 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 will push me forward faster, maybe on this journey or not. It's fine if it doesn't, but I think for so many people, this is what they want. And so I'm glad that you created this, this thought around it, this, this new way of thinking about it. So again, like you said, it makes it more accessible. Yeah. And, and first off, high five for being so well set for your traditional retirement that that alone is a huge accomplishment. And I think we don't celebrate that enough. Right, right. And so we're going to talk more about how people listening, how journeyers can set themselves up to do this too. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, so just let's 
talk about how much money people need. You, we have this typical calculation that goes around in the fire community. 25 times your annual expenses is the roundabout number that you need to save up. And so you have like made a little adjustment, which I actually like. It's more conservative. You have, it's 30 times your annual expense plus a 10% contingency. Can you talk about like why you chose to even be more conservative and actually what those numbers mean? Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm sure that most of your listeners are familiar with the 4% rule, the idea that if you have a starting portfolio, you can withdraw 4% each year and have a reasonably good chance of not running out of money. It's actually a little more complicated than that. You only adjust it by the consumer uh, price index, not by inflation. But I spent a lot of time looking at research. And a lot of this, I'm really indebted to Karsten Jeske, who writes Early Retirement Now. He is an incredible economist who's done some fantastic breakdowns of numbers and analyses of the early retirement math. And his math shows that if you go down to three and a half percent, instead of 4% withdrawal, that that makes a huge difference in terms of your likelihood of not running out of money later in life. So that was really the driver behind this is I don't want to guide anyone down this primrose path of, look, you can have your freedom, but also you might run out of money when you're 80 and you can't do anything about it. I have no interest in coaching anyone to do that. So 30 times your annual expenses gets you more to that three and a a third to three and a half percent safe withdrawal rate, which is definitely safer statistically. And then the 10% contingency is really there for a couple of things. But the main thing is healthcare. Uh, We are in a time of just massively uncertain healthcare. We we have the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, sometimes called Obamacare. Uh, So it is a far better time to be an early retiree than it was before that passed. But we also recognize it's so politically charged, it could go away at any time. And if that happens, healthcare, health insurance could just get massively more expensive. The other thing too, is most people dramatically underestimate how much Medicare uh, will end up costing them. Uh, Medicare only covers 60 to 70% of your expenses. So most seniors who are on Medicare still have hefty out-of-pocket medical expenses. So the 10% contingency, it can cover a lot of things, but that's really why it's there is just to insulate against future healthcare uh, cost increases. And I'm so glad you brought up healthcare because this is the number one, not number one, but it's a high up reason for a lot of people to be afraid to pull the trick on early retirement or even just leave a job that they're not happy with. It's what do I do about my insurance? And the it's so complicated, even for me. And, you know, I am lucky that I have a husband that works so we can all be under his insurance and he has a good plan. But for a lot of people, they don't have that situation. Or if there's a couple that both want to retire early, or there's a single person thinking about retiring early, let's dive a little bit deeper into this healthcare topic. And I'd love for you to share just um, some facts around it, some ways in which people can insure themselves while they're not working traditionally. And you, I mean, you're, you were, you did a lot of work in this field when you were working. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, healthcare is so, so critically important. And I think such a scary topic for a ton of people, but certainly people who are looking at walking away from traditional employment. And that was for sure true for us. My husband, Mark, has an autoimmune disease. I have a genetic disorder. Uh, We are people who have pre-existing conditions and need to be covered. Uh, And so this was always important. And yeah, I did some health policy communications during my career. So I, I got some of the behind the scenes info. But the main thing is just to know that the Affordable Care Act, as it currently stands, which it's, you know, it's in the courts, it has technically been struck down, we don't know what's going to happen with all of that, Uh, but it does guarantee that everyone can buy health insurance and that you can't be discriminated against for pre-existing conditions. However, you can be forced to pay higher rates because of your age. So this is something that I think a lot of folks are not factoring in. You can estimate what it will cost you anytime by going to healthcare.gov or to your state exchange site. And you can look at shop for plans or compare plans, uh, some description like that, and then put in what you expect your retirement income to be. And remember, things like Stocks, if you sell, let's say, $1,000 
of shares, that's not going to be $1,000 in income. Only the capital gains, the amount it's increased in value counts as income. So thinking about it that way, looking at what you expect your income to be, you can estimate what your health insurance costs will be currently, which is super helpful for planning and budgeting. But then you have to remember that there are these points generally around each decade. So uh, my first year of early retirement, I was 38 and Mark was 41. And so our average age was under 40 uh, for our household insurance. And so our rate was one thing. And then this year for the same plan, the price difference was $400 a month because we went up to 39 and 42, which that is now an average above 40. So that's something that people need to factor in that your rates do go up. And by law, people over 50 can be charged double what those under 50 can be caught can be charged. So it's just good to know that your healthcare costs are going to keep going up. Right now, on average for everyone, healthcare costs are going up about three times the rate of inflation, which again is why I think 30 times your expenses plus a 10% contingency is really wise. Uh, so it shouldn't scare you. There are a lot of good resources. I talk in the book about your different options, whether it's traditional insurance, whether you want to have a high deductible plan with a health savings account, an HSA or not, uh, things like uh, health shares, the the kind of religious option, uh, which I actually don't recommend, but I know some folks like them. So there are, there are different ways that you can make it work. And I do want everyone to know, you know, you've got options as an early retiree, but it's good to be really clear eyed about the costs involved. Mm -hmm. And to do definitely your research. And it's something I want to dive into on a separate like episode, just more into this topic, because it is something that is so important to understand because it is such a big cost. And you talk about the two biggest costs in retirement that you do need to just make sure you understand are healthcare and then shelter um, living because those are your highest expenses. Where you live or how much it costs and then like if in terms of like a mortgage or rent and healthcare. So let's talk a little bit about the living expenses side of things and how one can start thinking about that and optimize that in a way in which they can feel like re early retirement or a work optional life can be for them. Yeah, the, the main thing that I recommend on housing, besides the obvious stuff, which is like, don't overspend, don't keep upsizing your housing. You know, if you can stay in a starter home or stay in an apartment uh, that's not huge forever, you're certainly going to save a ton of money that way. But the biggest thing that I think folks need to think about is, is planning kind of for each chapter of life. So maybe you're going to do one living situation in early retirement. And then in the early portion of your traditional retirement, you do something else. But don't forget about old you, you know, about those later years in life. Uh, you know, I see people retiring to live in an RV or to retire to a tiny home or to do some really non-traditional living arrangements or people who are just permanent nomads and travel the world, uh, which for sure the appeal of that lifestyle is obvious. The thing that's important though is to make sure that you have an option to get off the road or, you know, to make yourself more permanent. Because are you really going to be climbing up and down a ladder to your bed in a tiny house when you're 75? Are you really uh, going to be able to have an in-home nurse come to your uh, RV? Those are things that are important. And particularly because if the rules do not change, what's important to know is Medicare covers almost no nursing home care, but they do cover in-home care at a pretty good level. So being in a living situation in which you can age in place gives you a huge head start financially on a lot of folks. Because if you know that your living situation could be wheelchair accessible, uh, you could modify the bath or shower so that you can still use it if you couldn't walk, uh, that you have wide enough doorways that you could have a hospital bed in the home if, if necessary. Those are things that seem small and insignificant and are hard to think about when you're 30 or 40 or whenever you're listening to this and planning those things. But the main thing is you don't have to have all those answers now. You just have to make sure that you've thought about that, that you know you're going to have money to give yourself flexibility later in life to be in a living situation that can accommodate you, whatever that looks like. Mm, such great, great um, like thinking points. Um, and, you know, so in terms of like planning for the long term, you talk about in the book and just in your content overall that you basically you when you guys were saving, you, you guys made a really like good income together, but you saved and you were aggressively saving. And even with the thought that you could actually kind of loosen up and live a little bit 
more not abundantly but you can spend a little bit more in your later like in your later retirement in your traditional retirement and I actually like that concept because I find that some people when they are thinking about early retirement and they're being super frugal they're expecting that they're going to spend maybe only twenty thirty thousand dollars a year forever and again if that's what's going to work for you that's that's great but I know for like myself I actually don't want to be so budgety (laughs) and like when I am 65 or when I'm 55, when the kids are gone, because you know, we have three kids, right? So when my husband and I finally get our lives back, if that ever happens, like I want to be able (laughs) to go to restaurants um, more often, you know, but have the money to do that. And so I like that you, you thought about it in the case and the way we're thinking about it is, okay, yes, we, we can be a little frugal now because we're trying to actually set ourselves up so we don't have to be as frugal or, you know, as penny pinching, not that we are super penny pinching at, in the future. Do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. And and I really highly recommend that people think about this approach, that instead of just saving one big pool of money for early retirement or semi-retirement or whichever model you're going for, that you think of early retirement and traditional retirement as separate and you save for them accordingly. And I do really recommend creating a, a plan in which you have more to spend in your later years. One, because of healthcare, as we just talked about, it's so unpredictable. None of us know what's going to happen. You want a big cushion. But yeah, like you just said, when I'm 70, am I going to want to clean my house by myself? Mm-hmm. Uh, or like, do like I can't imagine putting Mark up on the roof to, you know, do roof repairs when we're 80. Um, things like that, that yeah, it's really easy when you're young and able-bodied to think about having a very DIY lifestyle. But actually, giving yourself room to not have to do all that stuff yourself, I think is really looking out for future you and is something worth doing. And I think the related principle on that is something that I do think is not talked about nearly enough, which is you should not assume that you're going to live equally cheaply in early retirement. I will say for us, when you have all this free time, it's very easy to book a lot of travel or, uh, (laughs) <laughs> I've heard other people say you have a lot of hours in the day when you could be on Amazon. Uh, mm-hmm. like, <laughs> it is it is kind of the doctrine of retirement that you're going to spend less after you leave your career. I really think the only thing you spend less on is like work clothes. <laughs> Everything else, you have all this new time. You can indulge interests and hobbies and go go to lots of things, buy tickets. I mean, you don't want to be in an early retirement in which you've saved for a very frugal situation and you can't afford to do the things you want to do. So that's why I recommend in the book that people actually look at two different numbers of what can you live on right now while you're saving and then what will you live on once you're early retired and then maybe a third number of do you want that number to be even bigger in traditional retirement but you shouldn't assume that those numbers are necessarily going to be the same. We're definitely spending more now than we did when we were working. It's so true because now that I'm home and I mean, I'm, I have a, most of my day filled up with kids activities or things and then working. So I'm not, I don't have as much free time, but like just even in the summer when my husband's off and he's a teacher and if he's not working, we were just like, oh, you know, we don't want to be in the house. Do you want to go to our favorite place? You know, it's so it's, mm-hmm. I can definitely see how, unless you're very disciplined and just a naturally um, uh, less spendy or frugal person, like that might not be a problem for you. But just being also real with yourself. I think too, we try to put ourselves maybe in a box or do what we think looks good or sounds good. Um, and in the, this case, you just need to be real with what really is an ideal lifestyle. And, you know, as you were talking, I'm just thinking, this sounds so great. Um, you know, being able to save enough money to like live this type of life. And then I'm thinking about, like you just said, how we make, FI more accessible for more people and how it's harder for people with lower incomes, minimum wage, who come from just a more disadvantaged background that we're a lot of, you know, people of color dealing with the wealth gap. And so this Mm -hmm. thought of even having enough to live the life you want, it's like, I don't, a lot of people don't have or feel like they don't have enough money to live the life they want now. So the thought process of even saving more than they are now or saving enough is hard, right? Or it's just sometimes it's hard to ever get their, wrap their head around. So do you have any thoughts around that and how if someone is feeling that way, if like, is there a light at the end of the tunnel for them? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. And I think that's so true. And it's something that we don't acknowledge enough in 
the personal finance space. You know, there was that great piece uh, last fall about how most personal finance advice is terrible for poor people. And I totally agree with that. And I, and I will just admit, I don't think that this book is written for people who are really struggling to get by. Um, your financial reality is very different. And I think that, you know, I, I can't relate to that. And I wouldn't try to to tell you what to do. Um, but I think for those who may feel some struggle, but you know, you've, you're caught up in life and you don't necessarily know where all your money's going, or you haven't thought about a big vision. I do think there's still a lot in here that can be really useful. And I say right in the introduction, if all that happens from this book is you get really aware of your spending and you set yourself up to retire traditionally in a really secure way, you're still going to put yourself ahead of two thirds of people who do not retire when they intend to and retire into financial insecurity. So there are things like determining your values and what you truly value and figuring out what you most want to have as your legacy or what you want to be able to look back at the end of your life and say you did. I'm a huge believer that once you see that, it really changes a lot of your relationship with money and things that maybe you have spent money on to soothe yourself to, you know, reduce stress or to just kind of, you know, deal with some of the stress of the world some of those things might actually not feel necessary anymore if you have a really clear vision of what you're working toward, even if that's a very modest goal. Um, It certainly was true for us where I was never naturally frugal. I was never a saver. I I mean, I just straight up sucked at saving. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you could tell me all day long that I should save money, but I was like, like saving just to save, that sounds awful. Like, why do I want to do that when I have that money and I like I'm living now? Why would I not want to have like little indulgences? Um, But as soon as I understood what was possible, And even if that's not for you, full early retirement, it's maybe being able to retire at 60 instead of 65, or it's being able to take a year off to care for a loved one or, you know, whatever it looks like. Um, Once you have that vision, I think that your motivation totally changes. And so I think all of that is really not fully universal, but I think pretty close to universal. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you talk about a money mission statement, which would probably help a lot of people figure out like just really just a deep rooted things that matter to them when it comes around like money and value spending. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how someone can create one for themselves? Yeah, absolutely. So the money mission statement to me is just sort of like an internal statement that you carry around with you that helps you to guide your decision making process. It reminds you what you're doing all of this for, what the purpose of your money is. And it, I I think it's just really, uh, an important thing that help, that keeps you going in a journey like this that takes multiple years of saving. The example that I use is if you're a vegetarian and someone asks you, do you want a burger? You don't have to stop and think about it because you know like, okay, no, I just, I don't eat that. There's something in the money mission statement that's similar that just make some of these decisions automatic because if we rely on willpower all the time to prevent us from buying impulse purchases at the store or, you know, just kind of going off the rails with spending, we we have a very limited supply of willpower and we will run out of it quickly. So the goal is to try to automate some of that decision making and just make it not even a question for yourself, like the vegetarian turning down a burger. And to me, kind of doing that when, when we were going through that journey, I didn't exactly call it my money mission statement. But looking back, I realized that that was kind of the thought process I set up for myself of like, nope, I don't spend on that. Nope, I don't spend on that. It just had whole categories that I didn't even have to think about. That was for me so transformative that I wanted to kind of put a process around it to help people create their own. Mm-hmm. And uh, this probably also then ties into this, this concept that you talk about in the book and trips a lot of people up in this like constant wanting more and trying to like buy things to create happiness is the hedonic adaptation did i say that right yep you did (laughs) okay (laughs) i was like wait is that how you say it okay the hedonic adaptation can you talk a little bit about that because that that constant search for happiness and looking for it outside of ourselves creates this like consumerism environment, which then we just are on this kind of hamster wheel of wanting more. So let's break down what it is and how we cannot fall into it. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a 
well-researched psychological concept, not something that I invented. But the idea behind hedonic adaptation and what people will sometimes refer to as the hedonic treadmill is that we all have a basic kind of baseline of happiness and that you might have things happen that bring you temporarily above it or temporarily below it. And often we think of purchases as being associated with, you know, like that dopamine rush and we feel happy to have this thing. But that very quickly we come back to that baseline level. So the idea is that purchases we think are going to make us happier only make us happier for a very short time and then we end up coming back. But we're now poorer for having spent that money. So you might think, okay, well, I'm going to get this new car and that's going to make me happy. And it probably will for a little while. But then before long, you won't be any happier driving that new car than you were driving your old car. I mean, obviously, if your old car was a piece of crap and it was frustrating you every day, that's a different thing. But assuming it was perfectly functional, um, the new car will not ultimately make you happier. I mean, I think we can all think of little examples that are exceptions to that, sort of the Marie Kondo uh, spark joy idea. We all have things that we value above other things. So it's not to say that no purchase is ever worthwhile, but it's just to try to get us to rethink how we might be spending or what we might be be using things like shopping uh, for. If it's just looking for that short-term rush and recognizing like, okay, that's not long-term happiness and looking at our possessions and our purchases that way to help us uh, stop that. If, if that's something that you in particular do, it for sure was for me. You know, I always loved getting certain new things <laughs> and being able to take that step back and see like, okay, you know, that felt good in the moment or it felt good for a week while I had it. And then ultimately, you know, it was like I had never gotten it in the first place. Um, knowing that about yourself is just a good way to help rein in some of that problem spending. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just curious because you said you weren't super frugal and now you actually like kind of learned to like save more. But what are you spending more of now in retirement that you didn't spend working? Because you did say you were spending more nowadays than you did in your working life. So now I'm just like nosy. What what are you spending your money on? <laughs> Um, some of the little things are uh, hair color. I have purple hair now. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was working, I always had, you know, very consultant appropriate brown hair. And uh, it is shockingly hard to keep up bright hair color uh, for what it's worth. <laughs> and getting your hair bleached at the salon, oh my goodness, that is an ordeal um, financially. But no, the main thing that we are spending more money on is travel. Uh, in the last year, we went to Taiwan, Mexico, France, and Monaco. And those were great. You know, that was a big motivation for us to retire early was to have more time to travel and to be able to take longer trips than we ever could when we were working. But that stuff's not free. Uh, we have a lot of travel points. We cut the cost that way, but it's still, you know, doing four countries in a year, that stuff adds up. And I mean, that we have no plans of slowing down on that front. So we anticipate travel spending to continue to be much higher than it was when we were working. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming too, you're not doing like the backpack style staying in hostels. I mean, you probably are sometimes, but just considering because a lot of times people think, well, you know, I can really rough it and like get, you know, travel like I was in college or like on, really on a dime, which is fine if that's what you like but you know I know like my husband like he's not really into <laughs> all that like he wants to stay in a nicer place and so when I think about our travel budget we haven't been traveling lately because of the kids I'm trying to be realistic and like you're doing okay we're going to have some points but let's realistically think where we're going to both want to stay that's going to satisfy both our like wants and needs yeah we we actually do a mix so okay. in in Taiwan for example we we did stay in a couple of nice places that were just really cheap because Taiwan is a very inexpensive place to travel. But, you know, when we were in Taipei, the largest city, we could have stayed at the Marriott and it was like $200 a night or a whole bunch of points. But instead, we found a local hotel that had the most itty bitty room, uh, with, like the bed pushed up against one wall and then about six inches on the side of the bed. Uh, and that was, I think, $40 a night. So, we definitely are game to do that. I'm traveling in March and staying in a hostel in Portland for a conference. So we're game to do that stuff. But I think to your point from earlier, I have no intention of staying in a bunk bed when I'm 65 <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or like getting into a hotel room where we both can barely fit uh, when we're when we're 70. So that's part of it, too, for us is like I want the budget to stay in proper hotel rooms when we're older. And uh, I mean, like, yeah, in Taiwan, we had some rooms where the bathroom was down the hall. Um, like that's fine now, but I don't always want to do that. Right, right. Now, one of the things you did briefly mention earlier, and I want to touch 
upon it is that you have a genetic disability that, you know, you could talk more about what exactly it is. But when I was reading it, and I knew this about your story before and how this genetic disability that will uh, most likely impact your life in the future really caused you to look at what you wanted to do with your life and look at how you want to live. And it made you make the decision that, okay, I want to be more in control with how I work, how I earn money. And you just pushed you to retire or want to retire early. And you know how so many of us, like we have these hypothetical things that occur or people ask these questions. If you only had 24 hours left to live, if you only had, you know, if you knew you at 65, something would happen, what would you do differently? And then we come up with these ideas and ways in which we would just live our best lives. Um, you almost seem to like, have been able to do that because it's a reality for you. Can you talk a little bit about like what, what finding out um, like how you're managing having this genetic disability and how it really pushed you to want more from your life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My dad has the same thing that I have. We have a uh, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, HEDS, which is a genetic connective tissue disease that causes a whole ton, a whole slew of things throughout your body. Uh, but the, the biggest thing in terms of long-term health is uh, joint pain and uh, just kind of like chronic, chronic pain. Uh, my dad has a very particular neurological manifestation of it that fortunately it looks like I'm not going to get, but he started having that affect him when he was in his 30s. And he had to retire early, actually, in his early 40s from the disability. And that, I'm certainly not thankful that he has that challenge. And I'm not thankful <laughs> that I have HEDS. Uh, but I am thankful in a way that it seeing all of that, seeing his trajectory, knowing my own body, um, knowing that this is a progressive disease that gets worse over time, I, I am thankful that it helped me not put things off until I was in my 60s, which a lot of people do. A lot of people say, oh, that'll be something nice to do in retirement. I knew that by that point, I might not be able to do the outdoorsy stuff that I like to do. You know, we like to travel and walk 10 to 20 miles a day. We like to hike up mountains and ski and mountain bike and do all these things that require you to have a fully functioning body, which I don't think I'm going to have for all that much longer. <laughs> and so knowing that was really for me the big nudge to say, okay, it's time to get my finances together. It's time to actually do this and make it happen. Uh, or I'm just going to spend my whole life regretting the fact that I didn't. And I don't want to spend all my good years at work, which I think is something that, you know, that's a risk we all run. Uh, but I just had the luck of having that in very visible reminder to myself. And so I think if anyone else is thinking about that or you have a family history of some disease, like think about how you can use that as motivation to speed up your journey or to help you make some good choices that'll put you in a better position in the future. You know, you'll, that's something you'll never, ever regret. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, you know, the one last thing, I mean, there's so many other great points in this book, but one of the things I want to talk about is the concept of magic money streams um, because it just sounds so magical and so how what what are they and how does one build them because that's we are talking through how the average person can better their finances begin to think about how they can reach financial independence they do need to come up with ways in which they can create these magic money streams so let's just dive a little deeper into that so for those who are familiar with early retirement or are familiar with personal finance generally, the idea of what I call magic money is, is really the same as passive income or semi-passive income. I just think that those terms are so boring and uninspiring. And I tried to capture what felt true in our experience, which is, you know, they say like the first hundred thousand dollars of net worth is the hardest to save. And you, you move that up of like, Apparently, lots of billionaires will say the first million is the hardest. I can't relate to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but it's definitely true that the first hundred thousand is the hardest. And then once you move beyond that, it starts to accelerate. You know, you start to see compounding do its work. You start to see capital gains in there, helping it grow faster. The markets do more work for you. Um, and you eventually hit a crossover point where the market growth exceeds how much you are saving. And for us, when that happened, it really, truly felt like magic. It felt like, oh my gosh, every time I look at our numbers, they're bigger than last time. How is that happening? I didn't put more money there, <laughs> uh, at least, you know, in that moment. And 
it, it was something that just felt really special and inspiring. And once we kind of got to that point where it, it felt like magic, it, it really helped our whole journey. And we felt like it, it was going quickly and it just, it, it, it really felt very positive. And so I wanted to capture some of that and acknowledge that, you know, there, there is a point in saving and investing and seeing the benefit of compounding where it will feel magical. And so why not talk about the money that way? But yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it's sort of the idea that your investments are going to grow faster than you're withdrawing money out of them. And so they can last forever. And that's sort of like a magical regeneration thing. Like, did you ever read the um, Tommy DePaula children's book, Strega Nona? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have not. What is what is what is that about? She has like the magic pasta pot that kind of keeps generating. Yeah, it's it's like an old Italian woman who lives on top of a hill and she has this giant pasta pot that she cooks a little bit of pasta in, but then it keeps generating more and more. I mean, it's sort of like that. It's like this, the magic pot that keeps generating money for you once you just feed it correctly. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's kind of the image that I have in my head uh, on that concept. Right, right. And really, it's about getting to a point where you are getting compound the com- the magic of compounding interest to work for you getting to a point where you know quote unquote passive income you know is is working to your benefit and just increasing your income i mean it's just one of the things that i see is that the biggest hurdle for a lot of people is the income side of things where mm-hmm. you know there's but so much you can cut your expenses but if you're able to really increase your income and and bring more money to the table and save and invest that money. That's how you're really gonna gonna get to this like financially independent number. Um, totally, totally. And I think if if you do nothing else but contain your lifestyle, if you don't try to be frugal, if all you do is you try to keep your spending level year to year, and then you at the same time focus on increasing your income, that alone, just saving all the new income that you can earn and banking that that is going to get you a long way toward financial independence or, you know, another intermediate kind of goal. So I, that's part of why we didn't talk about the subtitle of the book. The, the full title is Work Optional, Retire Early, the Non-Penny-Pinching Way. I really wanted to make this a book that was accessible to all the folks who are not natural savers, who are not naturally frugal. And so we do talk a lot about things like that. Like, can you focus on earning more and make that the entire focus of your efforts rather than trying to squeeze every penny out of your spending? Because you can only frugal your your way to FI so far you do at some point have to earn more if you want to get there quickly. And I talk about some ways to do that. I talk about the power of negotiating for a one-time 5% increase and how much that compounds year over year. You know, that again is compounding in magic money. So it's not just in your savings and investments. It's also in your earnings. And I know that that is not equally easy for everyone, that our economy advantages certain people more than others. But the only way we're going to change that is if we all keep fighting for it. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Love that. Okay, Tanya. So I think this book is amazing. I want everyone to go out and get it. So please just let everyone know where they can find the book, where they can find more about you. The book is available in all of the bookstore places. So if you shop on Amazon, it's there. It should be in your local bookstores or they can get it for you. Uh, but yeah, all the book places. It's also if you're an audiobook person instead, it's on Audible. You can buy CDs, but, you know, streaming is so much easier. Uh, and, mm-hmm. uh, and let's see, you can find me at my blog, OurNextLife.com and on social at Our underscore Next Life. I also co-host a podcast called The Fairer Sense, C-E-N-T-S, with Kara Perez, who's wonderful. Um, that's really focused on on women and economics. So if that's your thing, find us over there. Awesome. Awesome. Now link all this in the episode show notes. Thanks so much, Tanya, for coming on the podcast again. Such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really hope you enjoyed that chat with Tanya. As I said, I really did enjoy her book. And yeah, she did actually shout me out and mentioned my little story in her book, pages 29 and 30. So thanks again, Tanya, for that. Um, She really captured my journey just she captured it well. So again, thanks, Tanya. Now, in general, I hope you gained a lot from this conversation, but I encourage you to go out and get the book. You can find out more about where to get the book in the episode show notes, journeytolaunch.com slash episode 84. Tanya and her publisher were nice enough to give me a few copies to give away. And so here's what I'm going to do. 
I am giving away one copy of the work optional book to a podcast listener. I'm giving away two other copies to members of the Journey or Launch Club. So Launch Club members, you don't have to enter this way. You'll find out how to win in the Launch Club. Podcast listeners who are not in the Launch Club, don't worry. I have a book for you. All you have to do is go to Journey to Launch dot com slash win and enter your name and email then the other thing i'd like to know is what you learned from this episode let me know what stood out and you can do that by tagging me at journey to launch on instagram twitter or facebook so share something that you took away from this episode you can even just comment on the episode promotion that i usually put out every wednesday morning on my instagram so Really, it's just going to journeytolaunch.com slash win, enter your name and email, and then tagging me, letting me know on social media in some way what you learned from this episode or why you're looking forward to reading this book. Once again, I want to thank you for joining me on this episode of the podcast. You can always follow me at Journey to Launch. If you want to hear more, follow me more on my journey to see what's going on with Journey to Launch. And then don't forget the Launch Club. You can find out how to join us in this membership community, this space which will encourage you to reach your financial goals, to live your best life at journeytolaunch.com slash launch club. Okay, until next week, keep on journeying, journeyers. <laughs>